Hello, and welcome to Abstra's AOS Extensible Device Agent Telemetry Collection and Data Streaming Webinar. So uh, I'm Derek Winkwart, and AKA CloudToad on Twitter, and I'll be co-presenting today with Jeremy Shulman, who's with me in spirit and virtually, uh, digitally, uh, in another part of the country, Jeremy Shulman, who is our uh, I guess, Head Automation Nerd, Head of Customer Enablement, at NWK Auto Maniac on Twitter. Uh, please follow both of us uh, for interesting technical content uh, about networking and network automation. So Thank today you. we're going to demonstrate... You're welcome, Jeremy. Today we're going to demonstrate for you how the Abstra Operating System allows you to get incredibly robust telemetry from your network. I'll start, uh, excuse me, we'll start by going over just a few slides to give you some context, and then we'll dive into to a, to a really cool demo. As always, we'll answer your questions at the end of the presentation, so please enter your questions below the presentation screen at any point during the webinar. Our presentation today will be about 40 minutes, depending on how many questions you ask. So let's get started. The pressure is on network engineers. That is the truth all the time. We are always under immense pressure. But in today's climate, we really are. We have a new kind of pressure um, to do things that we haven't traditionally done in the past. We have to build automation for networking tasks. Uh, we need, we have a huge amount of data in the network. Um, there's lots and lots of show commands uh, and counters and uh, protocol states and device states and uh, device statuses and environment like temperatures. And there's, there's just a ton of information in the network um, that can be harvested, and we need the ability uh, to control when and where we get this data and to process the data that we get into, you know, basically correlated and interpreted so that we have an understanding of what's happening in the network. And, and we need the ability, you know, to, to visualize this information quickly um, without, you know, waiting forever and ever to get something integrated into our uh, management platforms. And we have to do this for um, all different kinds of networks, right? As we know, um, it's pretty rare for for uh, for a bunch of different networks to be built in exactly the same way. In fact, that's almost never the case. They're all different in some manner. And, you know, it's got to be built for today's business demands, right? We have to do it quickly, and we have to do it accurately, and we have to do it, you know, in in stream with the rest of the business. So we're not the bottleneck. intent-based network analytics. So when we talk about extensible telemetry, um, specifically in the context of the Abstra operating system, uh, what we're really talking about is, in, is, is intent-based network analytics. And so, you know, as the network engineer, um, we are both the gatekeeper and the bottleneck, right, to answering questions about what's happening in the network. Um, it's our expertise that people rely on and because we don't really, you know, because of the vast amount of information that we have to gather and correlate, you know, we're also the bottleneck uh, in, in a way, and that's something we, that we're trying to fix. Um, and you need to share this information with the rest of, you know, the organization, not just the rest of your network team, but the rest of the organization, organization managers, application teams, you know, uh, product people, customer, you know, uh, advocates in, internal to your company. And you have to, in a way that they can understand it, right? Uh, and you have to give it to them now, not, you know, 10 days from now. So uh, what we really need is a solution that allows us to, you know, collect this information, um, test it against, you know, what, ex you know, the expected results. And, and when we say that, not, it's not just about, you know, the state of something in the network, but when we say, uh, test against the expected results. We mean, you know, we're we're gonna we need to define exactly what it is we need to get from the network, and so and then when we're um, when we're collecting this information, you know, we need to test that uh, it it comes together to provide um, results that are usable, and and then finally we have to translate this information, as I said, um, in a way that you know everyone else can consume because. 
uh, network engineers speak in a strange language that other people do not understand, <laughs> typically. <laughs> Jeremy constantly tells me. Right. So, uh, yeah, thanks, Derek. What I'm going to do is really kind of give a, a quick overview of the AOS uh, system architecture as a whole and then relate it back to how we do telemetry collection and, and perform these types of, you know, network analysis functions. So, you know, if you've watched uh, some of our other webinars uh, on the details of AOS, uh, you know that AOS is really a, a large-scale uh, system that allows you to turnkey manage um, your network infrastructure. And you may have seen our data center application where we do two-stage layer three cloths. But what I'm going to show you here is a little bit under the hood because in 1.2, we're exposing some of uh, the SDK features in a way that um, you can take advantage of this extensible telemetry. So in AOS, of course, we have this very sophisticated distributed data store, which allows the network, the managed network elements to communicate with our server. And I'm depicting here the agents uh, running on the devices. But in AOS, in, in AOS 1.2, these, these agents uh, can run off box. And this is a, a big thing for a lot of folks. And we'll cover some details on this on the next slide. But these agents are, are constantly uh, pushing data into our distributed data store, and so I'll call that telemetric data. Uh, the telemetric data itself is, is essentially anything you can capture off the box, any kind of show command. So it isn't just interface counters or numbers, but it is, like you said, Derek, uh, protocol state, uh, you know, any, any kind of uh, information you can get off, off the box. And, um, and once we've got this telemetric data in the system, we can also uh, identify parts of the data that we want to stream from the AOS server to you know, a customer's external system. And um, the way we do that is we package up the uh, stream data and we transmit it over uh, Google protocol buffers. And there's a lot of systems out there that uh, can you know, accept protocol buffers and then put them into whatever environment they have. Maybe it's a Kafka bus or some kind of Hadoop based system or however they wish to uh, do some kind of analysis or, or look at the data. Um, when you get started with AOS and uh, for the purpose of doing extensible telemetry, uh, we provide an SDK. And uh, this SDK comes with a pre-kitted environment so that you've got uh, Grafana for doing graphing and influx databases and all the sorts of kit that you need so you can get started you know, right away writing some code and seeing the actual result uh, very quickly. All right, so uh, let's go into just a little bit more detail about how the agents uh, work uh, with AOS, because we talked about um, agents in the context of AOS as an application, and like the application I'm showing here is what you see in the middle, this uh, picture where it begins with intent, services and systems and resources. And that's kind of an architecture of any application that one would run within AOS. So for example, our two-stage layer three class is a good example of that. Agents, again, is the point of control for a given system that, that can perform both configuration management uh, and uh, the telemetric uh, collection, so config and show. And in, in AOS 1.1, uh, we talked about on-box agents, where the, the software was running natively on the device for the types of devices that support that. And, uh, and the way that that works is uh, those devices then communicate back to the AOS system um, over the uh, AOS channel. Now, in 1.2, we've added the uh, off-box uh, agents. And th those agents uh, run on our AOS server, and they remotely connect to uh, devices in your network. They can use any mechanism that the device provides. So if you're talking about Arista, for example, they have eAPI, and if it's Cisco, it's NX API, and then you know, there's NetConf and SSH and all of these examples. So now customers have the, the freedom of choice uh, as well as the ability to onboard any type of device uh, into the AOS system. But the, the critical thing, the thing that's most important to me, actually, based on all my experiences in this, in this uh, world of network automation, is that our platform treats all the devices the same. Everybody's a first class citizen, whether if you're on box or off box. And the applications that are built in AOS, they're not, uh, they, they don't know if it's on box or off box because those applications uh, essentially see the same behavior regardless of whether it's on box or off box. 
So does that all make uh, make good sense, Mr. Derek? Did I miss anything? No, no, I I makes sense to me. Um, I so I see here um, we support NetConf or SSH or NX API. So we there's a variety of ways to uh, collect the information, not just CLI scraping. That's right. That's right. And in some cases, you know, it's possible that you might actually use multiple channels, you know, to communicate to a device. So you, you know, if, if the device, you know, allows that. So it's a very flexible system. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail, and then we're going to have some fun because we're going to do some um, live coding in uh, in a bit. So when I when I go through and I teach people how to write collectors uh, for AOS, I basically break it down into to three stages. Um, I like to have these very kind of well-defined stages because it's easier to develop and debug and test. And so the, the first stage we'll call is the collect stage where uh, the software that you write is running the commands to get the data out of the box. You know, essentially the show command, like, you know, do show interface or show mroute or some command. And, uh, and your collector can use any kind of output that the, the device provides you. So you could be running commands that collect JSON or text or XML, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's whatever the device provides. And you could actually run uh, multiple commands. You know, you might be writing um, a collector to analyze something about the device, and you may have to run multiple commands to get the data that you need for that, that analysis. And then you might actually have to combine the results of these multiple commands from different formats. Um, so we provide very flexible ways in which you can have this granular control. And, wow. and that's the that's collect. That's very common, by the way. Go ahead. Sorry. That's very, that's very common, by the way, the multiple commands thing. That's, you know, it, it's, it's almost never the case that when you're trying to figure something out about a particular thing, like, let's say, VRP, um, you never just type in one command to get a complete picture. You have to type multiple commands to really get the information that you need. So this is, you know, that's exciting to hear. Yeah, I think that's part of the the, the difference, the key difference between just saying uh, telemetry collection, which is, you know, most people just think like, oh, I'm just going to dump the output of some show command or stream the output of some show command. And the difference of actually performing an, a network analysis function, which is really what the network engineer knows, right? You know. Uh, like you said, network engineers, they speak a completely different language, and if it wasn't for you helping me out, a lot of times I'd be, you know, not sure what I was even looking at or why something was important. And so this gives the network engineer the ability to, you know, they know what commands to run, they know what data from those commands they want to uh, look at, and then this next stage, which is the PAR stage, is that part where they take the collected data, they pick out the pieces that they want, they may apply some logic, uh, to those that pieces of data, and then uh, what they give back is essentially a dictionary or a key value store of the information that they want to store in AOS, right? So that's the the parse the parse stage, and that's where I think the the quote unquote analysis uh, function happens. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So the final stage, and this is is optional, but we see this a lot, is um, you know, in, in a lot of cases, network engineers want to stream data off of the AOS server. So they might be collecting information. Um, I'm going to go through a simple example of this where we want to collect information and then send some of that information to an external uh, place. In this case, we're going to graph some data in Grafana. And the software that is written, what it does is it looks at the, the parsed data and it says, well, these are the pieces that I want to uh, stream. And, uh, and allows the, the network engineer to form the data elements that go into that packet. The collector itself doesn't do the streaming itself. What the collector does is says, here is the data element that I want the AOS server to stream. And then the AOS server is responsible for packaging it up into a protocol buffer and only transmitting it to the places that are registered with the AOS server. So those are the three stages, and I'm going to go through those in a lot more detail as we as we move along. But it's it's, it's important to me, at least when I uh, teach people, to kind of break things down into uh, consumable little chunks. So the next part is is you know well once you've written a collector, once you've got it, you know how do you actually use it in AOS? And so all the interaction with the uh, telemetry collectors happens through the AOS server, and so you use the AOS server to start, stop, and status uh, the collectors. And, uh, and you can run, you can designate 
exactly which collectors run for specific devices or specific device types that you're that you have under management. So it's very very granular. For example, you could say, well, in my spines, I want to you know run this set of collectors, and on my leaf switches, I want to run a different set of collectors, or you know you can arbitrarily make those decisions. Uh, you can use this collection mechanism without even using an AOS blueprint. So it's 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 actually a very easy way to get started with AOS. Uh, just to do some advanced, you know, network analysis. Uh, when you start the collector, you have options. You can say uh, how often you want the collector cycle to run. You might say, well, this type of collection I want to have every 60 seconds, or maybe this type of collection I want to have in every 10 minutes, or so forth and so on. And then you can also provide collectors parameters. So, for example, you might want to collect information uh, about a given uh, VRF. You know, you don't want to collect all the routes in your in your system, but maybe only those about a specific VRF, and you want to pass the VRF name to the collector. So again, you know, you can parameterize your collectors uh, that you uh, have under operation. And then finally, when you want to get uh, status about what's going on with the collectors, uh, you know, you can get obviously the information that the collectors are providing, so the data itself. But uh, really importantly, you can get the health status of the collector itself. And I'm going to show you this, where you can see uh, how many times the collector ran, were there any errors, how long it took to collect the data that you wanted, you know, a lot of the health information. And collectors themselves maintain their own logs, so you get a lot of uh, ability to log information uh, even within the, your own collector. And then finally, um, the information you can get out of the collector is the configuration that you use to start it. So if you start a bunch of collectors, and then you're just like, gosh, you know, what did I do? What did I start? What's going on in my, in my system? You can always read back uh, what you started. And so that's how uh, folks would interact with the collectors. They do that through the AOS server itself. Wow. And that's then, really cool. Yeah, yeah. And, and then this is the last slide, uh, pretty much, uh, where I want to cover what it means to be an agent, you know, or, or what it kind of looks and feels like when we talk about extensible device agents. Um, what we provide is a SDK, and that SDK includes a set of libraries. Uh, many of those libraries handle the, the various yak shaving in terms of communicating to the AOS server, et cetera. Um, and really what the, 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 the network engineer has to do is, is just write the very specific pieces of code that they care about you know, in their network that they want to gather and collect. And so in the middle here, I represent a box that represents an agent. And the, think of an agent as a software process. You know, if you were to do a PS, for example, you would see you know, for every device that you manage, you would see one process. And inside that process, what we have is essentially a device driver piece of code, and that is responsible for opening the connection to the device, you know, and owning the management channel or management channels. Um, and that's kind of like you write that once. And generally speaking, um, you know, you'll find that Appster has got a bunch of these in our SDK, but, you know, if you're a customer that doesn't have, um, if we don't have something for you right away, it's very a simple process to onboard new device drivers. And I'm going to show some example code, so, or actual code, that we're using so people can get a sense of what it looks like. And then uh, finally, the last piece is as you write collectors, uh, you onboard them into this uh, software process. So we're using a Python plugin mechanism, you know, that Python provides. And these collectors run in the context of that agent process. So you can turn on and turn off uh, collectors within a, an agent, or you can even dynamically load collectors within an agent because we're using this Python pluggable system. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense to me. Okay, I think I've rambled enough. Did I, did I, uh, did I forget anything I was supposed to talk about? I think I'm good. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think you're good. Okay, all right, cool. Let's cool. get to the, let's get to the uh, demo. <laughs> you wanna get to the demo? All right, so uh, let's do the first part of the demo. And uh, what we'll do is we'll flip over to an AOS server. So what we can see is uh, here we have an AOS uh, server and I've clicked on the devices panel and you can see that I have one device uh, in my AOS server and we can see that uh, it's Catalyst, the Cisco Catalyst, a 4500 that's using iOS XE and in fact this version. Uh, so I, 
I don't think we, we don't support Catalyst out of the box, do we? Well, you know, out of the box, we build uh, this very sophisticated data center networking application, and um, we've qualified a number of platforms uh, to work with that that application. So if you go into our hardware compatibility list, you'll see a lot of things that say certified, and that just basically means we've tested this hardware and this software, you know, against that application, and we know that it works. But we can add. Um, you know, knowledge to AOS to recognize any other type of device in the network. You know, for example, if I wanted to filter this list uh, down to Cisco, and you can see uh, what we've got going on here, you can see that I have this experimental, I've added this uh, platform, you know, and I've designated it as being experimental because I've added it, you know, kind of after the fact, and this is something that we're, you know, working on in the field. And you can see that I've kind of given it a unique name within our system. And I've given some information to AOS so that it knows how to recognize this device uh, when the device agent connects and presents its facts uh, to the system. So we can see that it's, it's written to recognize explicitly a Cisco 4503E. Now, any of these can be regular expressions. So I just kind of hard-coded this here. Um, you can see that we're expecting this type of version. And because I've designated this hardware model this way, I've actually also kind of laid out the uh, interface panel. So, you know, in, in, in my lab, I have uh, a 4503 with eight ports of 10 gig and 48 ports of one gig. And, and, uh, and this, you know, the process to really onboard, quote unquote, this information is really just defining this information as JSON and posting it into our API, which uh, I can show you. And it looks basically like this. Um, let's see, I'll make this slightly wow. bigger. So, so this is this is really cool for, um, and I'll tell you why. When there's um, whenever people buy software to help them manage their network, uh, you know, those vendors uh, of that software will say, we support you know these devices and these versions of the operating systems that run on those devices, and getting them to onboard new devices or new versions um, of or, or even new hardware vendors um, and their software, right, is, is, a, <laughs> is not easy to do. It could take months, if not years, if ever, if they ever do it, to, to add support for those platforms. And so the ability to sort of separate, um, you know, this from the, act, the life cycle of AOS, uh, is huge. That means, you know, if I have some device in my network, it's, you know, it's, the, it's a device we use. We have, you know, let's say a hundred of them and we're not getting rid of them anytime soon. We might even buy more. Um, I, I, I can add support for that device myself. And that's, that's what I'm seeing when you show me this. And that's a big deal. You know, that's a big deal to network engineers. Yeah. 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 Thank you. And, and it's really uh, very nice that we finally uh, are exposing this level of flexibility to our, our customers. You know, just just the other week, I was up in New York, and um, there's a there's a device I'd never seen in my life before because I don't operate in the financial world, um, and it's uh, it's a box that's kind of a, a physical layer cross connect switch that I'd never heard of, but they had a JSON API, and we were able to onboard that device, you know, like literally in a couple of hours, and then start gathering uh, telemetry, uh, which was very important to that customer right away. And uh, and we have like a little video of that uh, available online so people can see it. Um, so yeah, it was it's a very flexible system now, and it allows you know the user to have choice and control over what they want to monitor and manage in their network. Yeah, we recognize we recognize there are snowflake networks, there are existing networks. It's called the real world. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's get back to the device itself. Um, when I was talking about facts that we gather. You can see that there are some, you know, basic facts that the device agent uh, essentially provides when it when it registers to AOS. So here we can see that, you know, we're capturing the serial number, the hardware model, the version number. We're capturing uh, the MAC address, you know, you know, bits and pieces that you know we'll we'll um, that we look at. And on the next part of this is I'm going to show you exactly how we did this uh, in code in code. So uh, let's get started with that. All right. Let me make this slightly bigger. All right. So when we um, when we write uh, uh, an extensible device driver part of the agent, 
you know, as part of our SDK, we have this AOS device lib as it's, it's part of our SDK. And uh, really, there's only two uh, functions that somebody has to write, which is basically an open, which is, which, which is what it's called when AOS launches the process. And, uh, and you can see here we're using NetMiko, uh, which is a very popular uh, Python open source library for doing SSH-based uh, connections. Uh, so uh, we're using this in, and we're designating this as a Cisco XE. And then there's information that the AOS exchanges with the process um, during the start process. So it, it provides us the username, the password, the IP address, whether or not uh, this agent is running on box or off box. So there's a bunch of properties that are passed to the driver itself. And then um, once the device is open, then we have to implement a single function called get device info. I mean, technically, it's a method of a class, but, you know, get device info. And really, all this uh, method has to do is return a dictionary of the facts that AOS needs. And, uh, you know, here I'm saying it's uh, Cisco, and I've actually, you know, written a function that actually does all of the show commands and, and captures out all of the data uh, and then returns that to a dictionary. So I won't go into the details of, of that. And then... Um, since we know that Cisco IOS XE is all text, um, you know, our AOS um, SDK has a lot of pre-built uh, text processor collectors that you can use to construct your own code. And all it has to do is, you know, say, well, how do I get the results of a text-based command? And here, what we're using is the NetMiko send command expect. Um, so it, the NetMiko uh, library made this onboarding of this device type very, very uh, simple. And so I'm very appreciative of that library very much. So that's the device driver. Um, and then I will show one example of a, uh, an active collector that, that we've got running. So this is a case where we want to gather temperature sensors. I know it's not a very interesting example for a network engineer, but it's, it's something that uh, just kind of shows you the process. And you can see that uh, this is the data uh, that, you know, would come out of the device. So what do, what do you see, in, you know, in this data? Well, it looks like uh, it's it's a table. I mean, it's a table, fixed width column table. <laughs> That's what I see. Yeah. Oh, and it says Conan. Conan, what is best in life? <laughs> yeah. The movie, Conan? Yeah. Conan. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're old. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. I know. But yeah, I mean, essentially, uh, you know, what, what we see here is, you know, this is the text that comes out of the command, and we have to process this. And one of the things that I teach the network engineers is, you know, based on the data that you see, you know, there is, you know, a, a collection, a library of collectors that we have. And in this case, you know, they would recognize that this is a table, this is a text-based table, and it's a fixed width type of system because you basically have data in it that has, you know, spaces and so forth. And so part of our library has something called a text table fixed width collector. And uh, mm -hmm. essentially you provide essentially the cut widths of that. And then uh, based on those values, we tell the system uh, for this service called temperature, this is the collector that we wish to use. And I'll go through exactly how to write one of these in a minute. But you can see that uh, we're, we have something called temperature, and it's going to parse the data in terms of that data uh, table. And then we're also going to stream that data to an external system. So, go ahead. So that you're, so that this is actually, uh, so uh, this is actually a big deal because um, can you scroll back up to that table? Writing, writing code to parse that table, right? If you're a network engineer, right, and and you want to automate, you want to start doing automations. Um, what you don't want to spend a lot of time on is doing something that's probably been done a thousand times much better than than you might do it on your first pass if you're you know a network engineer and you're and you have basic Python skills and you're new to development. Um, why would you want to reinvent the wheel? Why would you want to write code that parses that table? And um, I know I've written code like that because um, I didn't I didn't have tools uh, that did those kind of things for me automatically. So. Um, this is kind of a big deal. In our SDK, we know that engineers don't want to waste time doing that kind of thing, right? The bug in your code should not be about parsing a table. So we have, um, it sounds like you, we have uh, uh, several different 
um, classes and methods to find that uh, or predefined, or I shouldn't say several, many that are predefined that we can use to do common things like parsing a text table. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. I mean, what what we're trying to do is, is find you know the, the the common patterns like you know like a fixed width column text table. And you know, as we work with our customers and we see different types of devices and we find you know the common patterns, um, you know, we continue to evolve and grow that library. I mean, if you have an API that is JSON or structured data, you know, like XML or JSON, you know, this problem isn't very hard. Um, but we still provide some really fun, you know, uh, collector types even to process those. But the the, re the reality is is that there's a lot of text-based systems out there, and they're not going away. Um, and so, um, you know, even if somebody's saying, "Yeah, I'm going to eventually use that equipment," or we're, we're migrating into that equipment, they still have the network that they have, and they still have the problems and the challenges that every network engineer has. So, um, you know, again, we want to build technology that uh, network engineers can can use and and solve real problems, you know, today, right? So, uh, yeah. Less yeah, yeah, yeah. yak shaving. Right. Less yak shaving. That's right. You know, uh, for sure. Okay, so let's let's uh, let's show how this actually works inside of AOS. So um, what you will see on the screen now is essentially um, some of the stuff that we provide as of our SDK, and uh, there's a there's a um, uh, a utility called Service that lets me list the services that are running um, in my AOS system. And we're using Ansible here to talk to our AOS API. So everything is available via our, our, our API. So anything that you want to do is programmable through our REST API. Now, we wanted to make that experience simple because, you know, again, less yak shaving. So we wrote some Ansible modules that allow somebody to interact with the uh, collector services of the API. So here we can see that I've got a device and it has one service running called temperature. Uh, and if I wanted to get the status of that, um, I could then run this command to get the status. And you're going to see um, a couple of things here, um, one of which is the uh, information about the uh, how long it took to execute, uh, how many times it ran, and the interval at which it runs, and uh, the name of the uh, temperature. So we can turn it on and we can turn it off. And then uh, we know that this data is streaming to AOS. So uh, what we can do is go over to Grafana, which is where all the data resides. And if I wanted to uh, use Grafana to just create a quick dashboard, uh, again, I'm no master of Grafana. I know just the basics of this here. I could uh, type this in and use uh, information, which you can see here, I've got a, the temperature uh, sensor that you saw the name of, and then the current value, uh, because there are two fields of data that we're streaming. One is the current value, and the other is um, whether or not there is an alarm status. So this is basically pulling it out of the database, and I could clean this up. You know, I'm, again, no master of Grafana, but I know this. So we can see, you know, for example, these are the pieces of information that are available in the graph and you know I could play around with Grafana to make it sing and dance but you know that's that's not something I want to do right now but the, the the point is that we can you know send this data out and you can see it in Grafana or any external system and we provide the Grafana system for folks so that again they don't have to yak shave and try to um, spend time setting up just something so they can see the data that's being sent out wow. pretty cool so uh yeah. So I, again, you know, I've, I just remember I, you know, working in a company where um, I needed information and from the from the network, and I had opened a ticket to get it added to our network monitoring system, and it took days, sometimes weeks, for that to happen. And this, um, all of this, um, you know, greatly shortens the amount of time it takes for uh, for me to get what I need, which is, uh, well, you know, which is awesome, right? It's it's shocking that this hasn't happened before. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, before we leave this example, you know, this is, uh, you know, what you saw on the Grafana was there was something called temperature because uh, this is the name of the, the data type that we've put into the tag area. And then you can see that the, the fields of data that we're streaming out is the current temperature and the and whether or not the uh, sensor was okay. I'm going to go through and 
start with the entire process from scratch, how I uh, work with a network engineer to build a collector for the very first time. So we'll go through all the details of this, but I just wanted to tie this back to the code so you, you kind of understood where the, the word temperature and current came from. Thanks. Okay, so let's do not only a live demo, but a live coding demo. All right. So the first thing that I like to do when I teach people is how to develop code offline. And what I mean by that is um, you don't have access to the network. Uh, you might not have access, you might have access to a network, but you don't want to touch your production network. And so how can you develop code in a way that doesn't touch the network and you can you know, essentially dev test, meaning I can write the code and I can unit test it before I even put it into production, before I even put it on the AOS server. Um, how do we do that? Um, and this is a very important uh, process to, to learn how to do, I think. You know, I, I always learned to, you know, when I was doing martial arts, it was like learn how to fall down first, you know, kind of, kind of use case. So um, I'm going to go through an example where uh, somebody wanted us to collect information about multicast. And I don't have a multicast set up in my network, um, let alone, you know, how to set one up. So I said, uh, what's the command that you use? And they said it was a show IP MRAP command. And I said, OK, well, send me the data. Um, and so let's say that this is the data that uh, you're given as a sample, right? And what we can see here is that this data is text. And it's, un it's kind of quasi unstructured. Um, but you know, here is your obviously your multicast route and some information that you want to gather out of it. So I'm going to go through the process that I, I show folks. Um, the first part is just creating the collector itself. So I'm going to go into um, my folder over here. So you can see I've got a, a repo called AOS device iOS and a telemetry directory. And I'm going to add a new file. And I'm going to call this mroute counts. OK, let's make this a little bit bigger. All right, so the first thing you have to do is you have to define a function called get collector. And what this does is this is how the AOS system gets the collector uh, for a given service. And what's really important here is that during this process, this function is given the device instance that's running. And this device instance has all of the facts about it. And you could look at the device facts and say, well, it's this version of code on this version of hardware. And because of that, this is a text-based version, or maybe it's a JSON-based version. You know, Maybe you're going through a migration period. The, the cool thing about this is, is you know, as, as the, the person writing this code, you can check for those differences, create the collectors accordingly, and then the information that you're storing into AOS is, is normalized. So whoever's consuming the data doesn't really need to be bothered with all those kind of minutia differences. And, and I don't know, Derek, I think that's a, that's a huge deal uh, because people are constantly you know, changing hardware and versions of software. And they always ask the question, you know, well, how do I deal with that kind of situation? Because I might have different versions of operating systems in my network. Can AOS do, deal with that? And, and, and yes, I mean. Yeah, it, it is a big deal. I mean, like you said, it's, you, know, um, you have multiple devices in your network. They present data in multiple ways, different access methods, different formats, right? Different. Uh, syntaxes and in having tools that help you deal with all those differences um, makes the job of creating automations that are meaningful to you a lot easier. Yeah, absolutely. So let's see, let's kind of go through the process. So I know that I need to return a, a collector. And so what I usually do here is I'll take like a piece of this data just so that because uh, I can never keep things in my head because I'm getting old. Um, let's put this up here. And uh, just drop this here. OK, so I know that this is a text-based collector. So I'm going to say, uh, from AOS device lib, uh, collector types, import. And then if I start with text, I can see what I've got here. Text FSM collector is a uh, collector that is based on the Google text FSM library, which is a very popular library that somebody else wrote for us. Uh, for, the, for the networking world, it's great. Uh, there's a lot of documentation on it. And I think there's actually some good examples of uh, text FSM out there for network engineers. So we are simply wrapping around that, that same exact library. So I'm going to create a text FSM collector. And I'm going to call this uh, mroute counts. And uh, the next thing I want to do is I want to say, well, how do I collect the data for this device? So I'm going to say there's a collect data handler. 
And when you see the word handler, it means you have to give it a function that is going to get called in order to actually collect the data. So I'll call that get mroute counts. And of course, that means I have to create that function, get mroute counts. And what that is given is the run, the, the instance of that collector. So inside the device agent, you know, it's created an instance of this uh, collector uh, when you tell it to start the service. So we have that. And that collector has as part of it the associated device. So the collector has the actual device uh, associated with the collector. And, and we know that that device has a function called uh, get text. Okay. And we want to return the output of get text. And the command in this case that we want to do is show IP mroute. And let's make the, this example kind of interesting. Let's say that we want to do it on a verf basis. And we want to provide the verf name as part of this uh, command. And uh, when we look at this text output, we can see that it looks like this, this data has been grepped out of, or, or there's a, a pipe function. So I can say include only um, source count, I believe is correct. And, um, and this is the command that we would run to get basically the, the sample output that we've seen. So the verf, where does that come from? Well, the collector itself has the service input data that is uh, provided to it when you start it. And uh, we'll say that there is a variable that was provided called verf, and uh, we'll just pull that out, and we'll just pass that in here. So this is essentially all the user would have to do to run the command to get the data, and that's the whole responsibility of the collect stage. And, and at the end of this, essentially what's being returned is something that looks like this. Now, the next step is to parse that text. And because we have a text FSM collector, what we want to do is we want to tell the system, hey, during the parse stage, I have a, I have a text FSM template that I wish to use, and we'll call this, you know, mroute count template. And of course, I have to define what that looks like. So let's say this is an mroute count template. And we know that what we have to really do here is we have to make a uh, text FSM uh, thing. If you've never seen text FSM before, um, essentially it's a very sophisticated library that wraps around regular expressions. So what we simply have to do is make a regular expression to match against. And so the way I like to do this is to copy paste something that I know. So Let's say that uh, when we want to start to match, we're going to match a line that has the word group, and we are going to create a variable for the data that we want. So I'm going to I want to create a variable called group. I'm going to create a variable called uh, source count. I'm going to create a variable called packet forward. Packets forward, and I'm going to make this a little bit smaller so I can finish this and packets received. And we know that that is going to constitute a record. And essentially, that's an indication to the TextFSM library to capture a line of data. Now, what we have to do, we also have to tell TextFSM how to recognize that data. So it's with value statements. So we have these variables, and each of these are values. So source count. And then we have uh, packets forward. And we have uh, packets received. And then we have to tell what the regular expressions are. So we know the numbers are pretty easy, right? These are just numbers, 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 numbers. And then group, uh, basically, since it's an IP address, uh, I'm kind of lazy in my regular expressions. I'm just going to say everything that's not a comma uh, is uh, what I want to capture. So it's basically going to capture what I want. OK. So this is the es essence of running the command and then processing the data through, through this uh, template engine. And as a result, the library is going to create a dictionary of data. Uh, by default, it will the key will be the first uh, value, the first variable. You can control this. But by default, it's the first one, which is convenient for us here. And then the rest of the values will be the dictionary values of the, uh, of the sample or of the data. OK, so let's run this. Let's actually run this. Uh, and the way that we do this is um, in the um, AOS device, iOS, uh, there's a test directory. And this is where we're going to use Python unit tests and the mock library. Um, and I teach people how to do this. 
Um, and essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the sample data through this collector and as a result, it's going to snapshot the data as, as the result of what would go into AOS. So I'll say make snapshot. Now if I make a code bug, it'll say, oh gosh, this, you know, I've, I have a unit test case that says look for MRAT counts. And it says, oh, I don't know anything about this thing called MRAT counts. Why is that? Well, we're using, um, you know, the Python library uh, and the plugin system, which is called entry points. And here you can see that we've defined the services for iOS XE and we don't have, you know, M, uh, multicast route counts. So as part of the SDK, we can say uh, in the library, we would say make. And what this would do is it would look in that library and then rebuild this. And now you can see that I've got the service called mroute counts. And that comes from this module that we just created uh, from this function called get collector. So we, that, that basically builds this entry file for us. And then if we um, do make setup, all this is doing is calling uh, Python setup to uh, load that setup file. And now the Python package management system knows about that. So if I go back to tests and do make snapshot, we can see that this test now passed and it's created some results. So let's take a look at the results. If I look in my snapshots, you can see that I've got two files, one for posts and one for so posts is the data that would actually get uh, sent from the collector to AOS. And you can see that um, the data is being stored as key value pairs. Um, and what you're seeing is the, the format in which we transmit and receive data or transmit data out. So we have uh, the, the key here, which is the multicast route. And then you can see all the values here that we've captured. And this is basically telling us that the template that we wrote, you know, works great. And we can also see that collector is not streaming any data. There's nothing being streamed here. So uh, any questions before I move on? Uh, actually, <clears throat> we are we are definitely getting close on time here. And I, I one thing I, one observation I'm making here is um, so you you know, we have an SDK that's actually sort of built in gear uh, 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 an SDK um, and a platform, really, that's geared towards network engineers to help them build network automations. We have predefined uh, classes and libraries and modules they can use so that they don't have to do, you know, a lot of uh, yak shaving on very common things that are that are not core to what they're trying to accomplish. And we have, and this is real, I've never seen this before. Um, uh, again, I've never seen this before, but we, you have the ability to write this code and, and test and validate it before you put it into production. And, and um, in fact, uh, as long as you have the test data, you know, like from a, you know, a, a, any device anywhere in your lab or, or sample out for, from, from production, you can develop this without ever touching the network. Um, uh, and then when you're satisfied that it's producing the results you want, then you can deploy it. And that's, you know, that's really cool that we're providing all of that inside of this SDK. Yeah, I, and I, again, it's really important, and this is why I teach it first, is to use this, you know, essentially mock develop, you know, mock data um, sequence because, you know, even if you had access to a network, you might not get the sample, the data set that you need in order to test every single, you know, corner case of what you're trying to collect, you know, because depending on the nature, and this is work, it's really hard for, you know, complicated, I should say, you know, network engineers deal with complicated data and complicated sequences and uh, a referral, a referencing different sets of data, and so. It's hard to write code, you know, for test cases, you know, or, or using data that you don't have, right? Uh, and this gives you a very controlled environment in which you can, you know, write your code and then test every single sequence. And uh, the one thing I will show you is that once once you test, uh, once you do the snapshot and then you actually run the test against it, um, what this will show you is actually your test coverage. So here you can see that you know in my in this particular test case I've got 63% uh, unit test coverage uh, you know based on the way I'm doing my testing and if you write a you know maybe you're writing a pretty sophisticated you know collector because you're dealing with a very sophisticated problem and you might need two or three different types of data sets to make sure you're exercising every line of code in your collector this is a way that you can see that you have 100% test code coverage and this is just using you know the python pi uh, pytest infrastructure and coverage tools that come with python 
Um, and this is something that I teach people how to use. Um, and it's a habit that people will get into because then, they're, then they feel, you know, more confident about, okay, I know this test, you know, I know this code will work, and then I put it into production, or I put it into my AOS server, at least in my lab, and then they can validate it through, you know, an actual live system. So um, that's what I feel very, I clearly I feel very passionately about this process because um, I think it's very important, so. It is, and uh, it's very cool, right? It's, um, I'm sorry, it's, it, this is very cool because um, you know, I don't think this kind of attention has been, has been paid to, you know, we keep saying network engineers have to be developers and, uh, you know, we have to define what that means and we have to give them the tools that enable them to develop in a way that works for them and then helps them solve their problems. And so this is, you know, this is very cool, Jeremy. Cool. Well, uh, I, I've been, I've been working with some, some folks recently and it's fun to see their eyes light up and they're like, yeah, you know, I'm a network engineer. I just got started with Python. I'm playing around with a bunch of different tools. And uh, at the end of the day, they're like super pumped. They're like, oh, I can't wait to try this out. You know, it's, it's very rewarding uh, to see that happen. And so I really enjoy it. And uh, oh. so I know we, we're running out of time. So I know you got some questions, I think, that, that are coming online. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's get to some questions. We have ooh, nine minutes left. Let's answer a couple questions and then we'll, we'll wrap up. And uh, we have something to announce here about Cisco, our, our, uh, our visit to Cisco Live this year. So, um, we have, let me see, let me look, read through these questions real quick. Uh, I, I, we're definitely not going to be able to get to all of these, but we have, right. um, can, uh, okay, here's one, Jeremy. Can you create telemetry from telemetry, like create a consolidated view of something in the network across multiple devices? Yes, yes. So, uh, Derek, why don't you kind of give an example of what you think they mean? Um, so I, so I, so right off the bat, I would say, um, let's say you know you have a, um, okay, we'll we'll actually we'll use Verp as an example. Uh, if you have multiple div, um, like routers running Verp, and you want to know, you know, you know they're participating together, right? Two or three routers, let's say, that are talking to uh, each other via Verp, and one of them has been you know, is, uh, has assumed the master role and the other ones are in whatever standby mode. Um, uh, and you want a complete view of which devices are in that, uh, in that VERP domain or in that group of, uh, that VERP group and, and you want to know what their status is and you want some, you know, metadata around the interfaces that are participating, you know, that kind of thing. How do you create, like, okay, tell me about VERP group X, right? That would be, that would be my uh, assumption of what they mean. Something yeah, like that. yeah, sure. Yeah, we can do this with AOS. This is this is actually a something very common real world use case, which is, is I want to perform you know some network analysis on some protocol on some on a on a series of boxes, and then I want to gather all that data. I actually want to run a collector on that collected data, and then uh, provide a summarization or some final analysis on it. Um, and that is a very practical you know, common use case, you could do that for multicast routes, you could do that for VERP. It's, it's, I would imagine that's a very common use case for, for protocols because of the distributed nature of protocols. And that is definitely something that uh, that we can do with AOS today. It's, it's uh, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting demo um, that I would ha be happy to show folks, uh, you know, if they'd like. Uh, we're obviously running out of time, but yes, that's a, that's a very practical network engineering uh, use case for sure. Much more interesting than temperature sensors. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, okay, this one sounds simple, and then we'll we'll cut to the last uh, to the Cisco Live now. It says, "Is the collection interval for all collectors, or can each be configured with a different interval?" Okay, yeah, every collector can be uh, uniquely configured. So you can have a, a collector that's running, you know, at a sixty second interval. You could have the same collector running on a different box you know, running at a 30 second interval. So, you know, you you have fine grained controls over those types of uh, service configurations, both the, the intervals as well as the, the input parameters like that for thing that we did here today. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Sweet. All right, so let's, uh, let's get to the Cisco Live part. Um, yeah. So if you are going to Cisco Live, please come by our booth, uh, booth 2925. That's 2925, uh, write it down. 
and and visit us. Right? You can even go on our website um, and and uh, or send us an email and try to schedule time to, to do a, a detailed sit down. We can go into even greater detail uh, about what you saw today, um, other with other examples. And uh, and the cool thing that we're going to announce is uh, we are raffling off a DJI Phantom 3 drone. And if you don't know what that is, that is like one of that's probably one of the best, if not the best, commercial drones that you can buy. It's two foot by two foot, uh, you know, in 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 dimension, and it's uh, it has an HD camera on it, and it runs for like 24, 25 minutes while in the air, which is one of the longest flight times for uh, for for a, a drone of that size. It's this is insanely cool. Um, I've seen mm-hmm. it. We're going to have it on display in a case. At least, you know, come by and have a look at it because it looks like something from out. And when you see it in person, it just, you know, it's it looks like it's from outer space. It looks really, really cool. And we'll be raffling that off. Um, so come by and enter the raffle. Um, you could win this thing. And, and, and whoever does win it, by the way, will be shipping it directly to your home from the event. So uh, that is our announcement, and we are very excited about Cisco Live, uh, especially with our new release of the S operating system, version 1.2. That's what we've been talking about. Uh, these these extensibility features that are new in version 1.2, the ability to add devices, uh, your support for new devices yourself to the App Store operating system, as well as add customized telemetry uh, um, uh, to to the system and to stream it to any any place you want to send it. So. Um, I think that we're going to wrap up, Jeremy. Uh, thank you for your time today. It's always a pleasure presenting with you. Thank you. Likewise. Likewise. And uh, I won't be at the Cisco Live, but if anybody uh, would like to reach out and schedule some time uh, to see more details about how you would write some of these collectors or if you've got even specific questions, you know, please reach out to us. Uh, we'd be more than happy to, to engage and, and have a conversation and show you how this works in more detail because, you know, I can go on and on and on for hours, you know, because I nerd out about, you know, this kind of stuff and I really enjoy it. So please feel free to reach out anytime. Yeah, yeah, we have yes, and we have lots of great content uh, on our website. If you want to learn more about our company, about the Astro operating system, uh, or about intent-based networking, uh, you know, please visit our site. Uh, we are we are hiring, so uh, if you're if you mm-hmm. want to if you want to get on the intent train, um, then you know mm-hmm. that's check out our website. And thank you for attending today. We're going to give you <laughs> the final three minutes back, and uh, we'll see you at the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you.